Ladies and gentlemen, this is a warning. Thank you. Chicago. Today, the city has a reputation for being a violent place, but in the early years, there was a belief of innocence around the Windy City. But that illusion would be shattered starting in the 1950s with a string of child murders. While none have officially been linked, there would be a number of similarities between the cases that set the city on edge and had many fear for their children's lives. In recent years, while one of these crimes has been solved, the links remain, and if it wasn't just one child killer on the streets of Chicago, were there multiple? goes on in San Francisco for the man known as the Zodiac Killer. There could be a serial killer in Chicago. The Oakland County child killer. Phantom killer. Frankfurt slasher. Four children have now been murdered. Has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Fifteen brutally murdered young women. The pattern is the same. One by one. The death count started rising. A man in a mask robbed, tied, and stabbed them. Strangled, stuck in burlap bags. It is highly unlikely that these women were murdered by separate men. Where will the killer strike next? The police can't answer who or why. That's the question that we'll never know. I don't want to live the rest of my life wondering if this person's going to be caught. I believe that there's someone out there that has knowledge. And he's probably still at large. It was Sunday, October 15, 1955, when 13-year-old John Schusler phoned his friend, 14-year-old Robert Peterson, to see if he wanted to go to the movies. When John's younger brother Anton heard this, he wanted to go along as well. After some arguments, the 11-year-old was begrudgingly allowed to go along. The Schusler boys left their home at 5711 North Mango Avenue and made the three-quarter of a mile walk down to Robert's home that was at 5519 West Farrago, both of which were in the Jefferson Park neighborhood north of Chicago. Once they got Robert, they rode a bus and then hitchhiked downtown to the now-demolished Loop Theater to see Walt Disney's new film, The African Lion. Afterwards, they went a few blocks south to the Garland office building to use the bathroom, as would be confirmed by Robert's signature on the register. Next, they went to two different bowling alleys, as Robert was a fan of bowling, the last one being the Monte Cristo Bowling Alley, formerly located here on Montrose Avenue, about three miles away from the boys' neighborhood. Their last sighting was about two and a half miles northwest of the bowling alley later that night, where a friend reported seeing them hitchhiking the last half mile back home. It would be the last time they were seen alive. Two days later, liquor salesman Victor Livingston pulled into the parking lot of the Robinson Woods Forest Preserve to eat his lunch. Just east of O'Hare International Airport, he parked in one of the first parking spaces to the right, overlooking what at that time was a small ditch before a flat brushy area you can see in this aerial photograph. But there before him in the ditch, Victor noticed a macabre sight. The bodies of all three boys showed signs of being bound and gagged. Their bodies were dirty, and the coroner stated they had been held in some dirty, filthy place. Robert had been slashed across the head 14 times with what was believed to be an axe or hunting knife. The Schusler boys had been hit on the face with the flat side of a knife, but all three died by strangulation. Also, there were markings on all the boys' bodies that were believed to have come from a pronged tool such as garden trowel or hand spade. Chips of steel were found underneath one of the boys' fingernails, and police searched nearly 200 metal working shops in the vicinity. Another lead that would be investigated later was Robert and John, who were both in the same 8th grade class at Farnsworth School, wrote something concerning on a school test. The question was, do you know anybody who is trying to harm or hurt you? Out of the 50 students in the class, only two answered yes, Robert and John. That test was just eight days before their disappearance. Six. 
six months later, the bodies were exhumed for further analysis, and minute traces of fertilizer were found on them. Now, golf courses and greenhouses were searched, but again, with no luck. By this time, the body of Anton Schusler Sr. had also been buried. The father of the boys had been sent to a sanitarium suffering from severe mental depression. The 41-year-old man died from a heart attack during electroshock therapy three weeks after the bodies were found. A group of wealthy Chicago men organized a crime detection institute and pledged a reward of $100,000 for the solution of these three murders. Despite this, the boy's case would remain cold for almost 40 years. This is 3634 South Damon Avenue in the McKinley Park neighborhood of Chicago. In 1956, it is where two sisters, Barbara and Patricia Grimes, lived. Three days after Christmas that year, the two girls left their home to walk a mile and a half southwest to their former Brighton Theater in Brighton Park to watch the latest Elvis Presley film, which would be their 11th time seeing it. Though they were just two of seven children, the 12 and 15 year old girls were described as inseparable. When they did not arrive home that night, the police were phoned and a citywide search for the girls began, the police no doubt recalling the triple murder just 14 months earlier. The king himself would make at least two media statements to the girls, asking them to return to their mother. A ransom note for $5,000 was sent to their mother, who turned it over to the FBI, but it was determined to be a hoax. Holding them against their will, if they'll please let them go, I'll forgive them but from the bottom of my heart, just so my girls get home. It was less than a month later, on January 22nd, when a man driving along German Church Road spotted what he believed to be mannequins on the side of this small bridge crossing Devil's Creek out in Burr Ridge. They were driving by and you uh, stopped Well, the yeah, I stopped the car yeah. and I went home and told the missus about it, and I says, I think I discovered two bodies laying on the a, on a side of the road on Devil's Creek. Do you have any idea how long these girls have been lying here? There's snow in between the bodies. There's some snow under the body, and uh, from the position and condition of the bodies, I would say they've been here into the a matter of days, three, four, five days. Three coroners would inspect the bodies, but could not provide a definitive cause of death, though hypothermia is the prevalent belief. The girls' faces had suffered beating, in particular Barbara's, and a rumor that their lips had been cut off spread, though the autopsy believed rodents had picked at them. However, Three small stab wounds about the size of pinpricks on Barbara's chest would have them recall the same wound found on the Peterson Schusler boys. Is there any similarity between this and the Schusler Peterson murder? Well, there are some startling similarities to begin with. First place, the bodies were without their clothes. Secondly, they were deposited in the remote section of the county beside the highway. They were thrown out, and uh, then whoever left them got away very quickly. Uh, they were obviously murdered at some other point and brought here to be disposed of. Also, there's violence, uh, evidence of it on the bodies. Uh, to this point, the parallel is exact between the two crimes. Uh, we've very carefully roped off the area, investigated the scene in every respect, and uh, the bodies are now being taken to the morgue where we will have an autopsy made and we'll see where the investigation goes from there. Have the girls been uh, positively identified as the Grimes girls? Yes, we've had their father brought to the scene and he identified them as his daughters. Were the girls dead when they were placed here? They appear to have been definitely dead when they were placed here, yes. Would you say the bodies were thrown out of the car or placed on the embankment? Well, from their posture, uh, they may very well have been thrown out, certainly very hurriedly deposited, uh, just to be gotten rid of, I would say. Do you think that the same people or persons who accomplished the Peterson and the murder were responsible? Well, I couldn't say that. I wish I had information that would make it as pointed as that. Maybe we'd be closer to a solution of both crimes. 
I don't know, but the similarities is something that commands our attention. An anonymous phone call a week prior to the girls' discovery stated that the girls' bodies were in a park in Santa Fe, an area just east of Burr Ridge. Police would search the park, finding just a yellow sweater, which was the same size and color as one Patricia was last seen in. The call would be traced back to being made by Walter Kranz, a steam fitter who claimed he had psychic powers and that he dreamed the bodies would be found there. A massive funeral was held for the sisters, which was paid for by donations from friends and neighbors, who also raised enough money to pay off the Grimes family mortgage on their home, which they were close to losing in the aftermath of their tragedy. It was May that year that the family received a phone call from someone saying he had helped kill the girls. While they had received other prank calls, this caller knew Barbara's toes were crossed on both of her feet a detail that had not been released publicly. He also stated the police were fools for pinning the murder on Edward Benny Bedwell. The illiterate dishwasher and former Carney was also wanted on an assault charge against a 13-year-old girl and allegedly confessed to the Grimes murders. However, his statement was full of inaccuracies compared to the evidence, and even the girl's mother had her doubts on his guilt. The charges made by Bedwell must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and he should be made to testify at this inquest and repeat these charges in front of our family. Our children are dead and cannot deny these lies, but our family must live with them. We demand an absolute vindication until proven otherwise. He would be acquitted in the Grimes case and that of the other young girl. Jenny, how does it feel to be walking out of jail? Feels fine. What are you going to do now? I'm going with my lawyer. How do you, how how do you, you think of your lawyer, Benny? That. He's great. How do you figure you got into this trouble in the first place? The, the, the fellas in there, you'll have an opportunity to see him later and talk to him at great length. And uh, the boy's been through a great deal, and I'd like to get him out of here now if, uh, if I may. Uh, Summer was winding down in the Windy City when the next disappearance occurred. 15-year-old Judith May Anderson was leaving her friend's apartment here at 1019 North Central Avenue at 11 p.m. August 16, 1957. The girls worked together as telephone operators at a Chicago modeling agency, at which Judith had been getting threatening phone calls during work hours. Her friend, Elena Abicola, offered to walk halfway with her, but Judith said it was fine. The walk back to 1530 North Lotus Avenue was only 20 minutes. She would never make it here. At the same time Judith was walking home, two people claimed they heard a gunshot and another phoned police saying they heard screaming at a nearby school. An extensive search was conducted again, but nothing would turn up for a week. This is Montrose Harbor, north of downtown. It was August 22nd when boaters found a 55-gallon drum floating in the harbor right here where today the boardwalk changes to a broken cement retainer. The men pulled it up onto the ledge and opened it up to the grisly sight of Judith's torso. Two days later, just south of here, a smaller drum was found. Inside it contained her head, hands, and arm. She had died from four revolver shots to her brain. Further south, a hatchet and bloody towel were found stuffed in the seawall around here. Witnesses would come forward saying that on the night of August 18th, as they were standing on the pier across the bay, they saw a car backing up to the seawall across the harbor, then hearing two splashes into the water. Just north of where the drums were found, some men doing a bit of night fishing stated they saw a man with a flashlight approach the seawall, leave, and then saw the car come down the road about a half hour later. The investigation would find some solid clues. The drums her body was in were uniquely sealed in a manner only used by scrapyards, railroads, or Pacific Front World War II soldiers. 
This time, however, a suspect turned up. Barry Xander Cook's mother worked at the same agency as Judith. The 21-year-old was suspected in several assaults on women and fled when police tried to question him. He was given a polygraph test, which he failed when asked about Judith's murder. He was sentenced to 11 years for the assaults and placed in jail with an undercover detective as a cellmate. After a few months, Cook reportedly confessed to the murder but shared no details, nor did his story match with the facts and he was never charged. The other two prime suspects were Elena Abicola's brothers, Nick and Joseph, who both lived in the apartment along with four other brothers. Nick had previously spent time in a hospital for molesting a young boy and Joseph could not provide an alibi for the night of the murder, as well as failing a polygraph test. Furthermore, he worked in a sheet metal plant. Police would question over 100,000 people in the three cases, but all would remain unsolved. I've been after this, on this case now for four years and without success. How long will you continue to work on this case? Well, we will continue to work on it until we solve it. How about you, Detective? Are you, are you hopeful of solving it? We always hope to solve it. We're hoping all the time. And sometime, maybe with a little bit of luck, we'll be able to solve it. As the end of the decade approached, Chicago was already beginning to see white flight to the suburbs, and for many, these murders were the tipping point. But as the next year would prove, the suburbs were not safe either. 15-year-old Bonnie Lee Scott lived with her aunt and uncle, who were foster parents west of Chicago in Addison, while her parents were in the midst of a divorce. It was September 22nd when Bonnie left the house to go shopping for a new blouse. After shopping, she was last seen at the 4D Diner, where a Walgreens now stands at Lake and Anderson. Failing to return home, her family reported her missing. Police initially believed Bonnie had run away, as she had done so in the past. After all, these were the suburbs. It was safe here. That illusion would be shattered on November 15th, when a group of Boy Scouts were hiking in the Argonne Woods Forest Preserve when they found something. About 250 feet south of 95th Street and just 15 feet off of LaGrange was the decapitated body of a young girl. She had three deep slashes to her abdomen. Her head and attached jawbone were found about 20 feet away. Dental records would confirm that it was Bonnie. Police began to look for Bonnie's boyfriend, Charles Melquist, who had already been questioned for some strange behavior at the time of her disappearance. On September 23rd, one day after going missing, Charles phoned the Scott home to report he received some phone calls that may be of interest. The 23-year-old denied being her boyfriend, but more of a big brother to Bonnie. He claimed first Bonnie called him that she was being bothered by a man, and later that man phoned him saying he had dropped Bonnie off in the vicinity her body would later be found. Charles was given a polygraph test, and upon failing two consecutive times, he finally confessed. He stated that he pulled into the driveway to his home at 655 South Yale Avenue in Villa Park and began to fool around with the girl when he accidentally smothered her with a pillow. After stripping her body, he would dump it in the Buttonbrush Slough of the Argonne Preserve. He would later return to the site twice after, first to see if the corpse was still there and then again with plans to bury her but he found himself overtaken with a compulsion to mutilate the body. He later recanted this statement, saying he had been kept awake for 68 hours of interrogation and confessed just to make it stop. The same time he was in jail, Loretta Grimes' phantom caller began again, this time saying, I committed another perfect crime. This is another one those cops won't solve, and they're going to hook it on Bedwell or Barry Cook. It was determined that Melquist had a history of stalking women and in at least one instance tried to strangle one. Found in his car trunk was a three-pronged garden fork and a neighbor of the Grimeses identified Melquist as having been in the Grimes' home the day the girls disappeared. 
The public wondered if Melquist could have been responsible in the Grimes and Anderson cases, and the police stated it was a remote possibility, but his lawyer wouldn't allow him to be questioned in the cases, and he would be convicted of just the Scott murder. Was a child serial killer off the streets? It was November 12, 1960, when nine-year-old Gloria Kowalowicz left her home formally in this vacant lot at the corner of 67th and South Damon in the West Inglewood neighborhood. Gloria was making the half-mile walk to the St. Mary of Mount Carmel Church, where she was a student. She had taken her first communion here on October 29th, and one of the nuns suggested the class take communion each morning for the next two weeks to impress the experience on their memories. Today was the final day of that plan. Gloria's parents owned a gas station that was located just a few blocks north of their home and had warned the girl to never accept rides or gifts from strangers. Just a few hours after she went missing, a laundry truck driver would stop on 104th Street in the Cherry Hill Woods area and follow a bloody trail leading 100 feet into the woods, where he discovered the child's body lying face down in a ravine. She had been shot twice in the head. Though her leotards were off, the rest of her clothes were still on, and the coroner believed she had not been assaulted. Two hundred volunteer firemen, along with two hundred Boy Scouts, helped search the preserve for a weapon or clues, and would turn up her shoes and purse. Her blue coat was found along the highway five miles away. St. Mary's Church held her funeral service. A thousand mourners attended, including the entire school class. The coffin pallbearers were the young girls from Gloria's communion class. It was believed that Gloria knew her kidnapper. Other churchgoers claimed that they saw Gloria walking the sidewalk one moment, and the next she was gone, but they heard no screams. When a similar murder took place in Ohio, police were worried the killer had moved, but despite similarities in the Qualowicz murder and the murder of Nancy Eggleston, a link was not pursued. Chicago was on edge. When off-duty police sergeant Richard Last picked up his child, he had his service revolver still on. Someone spotted the gun. Police were called and surrounded the car. One man stated he hadn't seen so many guns since D-Day. Just days later, police would arrest 28-year-old Leon Weber Jr. for abducting a 7-year-old girl and taking her to the Robinson Woods Preserve. When he tried to undress her, the girl began to scream and frightened him off. Six other children identified him in a lineup as attempting to abduct them. He was also spotted as being in the neighborhood of the Kowalowicz residence the night following her murder and had spent time in the Illinois State Hospital in 1957 for committing sex attacks elsewhere in Illinois. Leon freely admitted to kidnapping Peggy and stated he did not believe it to be wrong so long as what he did was in, quote, God's sight. A polygraph test proved inconclusive, but it was noted he became erratic when asked about Gloria's murder. Despite this, a fingerprint found on the murder girl's purse did not match Weber, and he was not charged for the killing, instead being indicted for eight other crimes against children. The same time Weber was being interrogated, police in LaPorte, Indiana arrested Robert Lee Stovall in a vehicle stolen from Chicago. When they found his clothes were covered in blood, he was promptly arrested and questioned. The homeless man was a recent asylum patient and described as a psychopathic liar and was sent on his way after the blood was found to be no match to Gloria's. A special detail of 10 detectives familiar with the seven unsolved murders were now assigned full time to the cases. Like clockwork, the next killing happened almost a year later.
Seven-year-old Yvonne Elliott was last seen walking with a friend in the Chicago suburb of Elmhurst when 13-year-old Steve Schloniger approached them and asked for her name. That night, the girl was found face down in a puddle amongst weeds roughly where this garage is now standing. Her hands had been tied behind her back and a gag was in her mouth. She had been assaulted. Schloniger was quickly arrested and confessed to the crime. The final killing came August 3rd, 1963. Eight-year-old Diane Taylor lived in an apartment at 5601 West End Avenue with her divorced mother. The pair had recently moved here after Diane had to spend some time in a children's home while her mother could afford to take care of them both. Described as a bit of a loner, Diane had one friend, Mary Manning, who she would go to the movies with each Saturday. Though she didn't much like school, she spoke of wanting to become a nurse or actress. That Thursday began like any other. Diane's mother left that morning. The latchkey kid would phone her mother later in the day to confirm she was going to the local YMCA for her swimming and crafting lessons that she had been taking. She was last seen walking in the alley behind the Y at 2.10pm, though it was later reported she may have been spotted later at a local roller rink. After arriving home that night and finding her daughter missing, her mother phoned the police. The following night, a man living at his home in 1051 North Lockwood Avenue reported hearing a low moan and someone slamming a car door in the alley behind his home. The next morning, a nine-year-old took her dog out for a walk where she discovered the mutilated body of Diane in the alley behind the garage of 1055 North Lockwood Avenue less than half a mile away from where Judith Anderson was abducted. Diane's funeral was held on what would have been her ninth birthday. A witness would also claim to see an 18 or 19 year old male leaving the alley in a truck that morning and police would interview all 750 male students at the nearby Austin High School. One of those students was Lance Jeffrey Voss. Cleared at the time, Voss would come back to detectives' attention when he became a suspect in the 1978 to 1981 murders of four women and one male in Idaho, which became known as the Lewis Clark Valley Murders. Lance was suspect in several more killings and was one of Diane's counselors at the YMCA, leading police to theorize she may have been his first victim. He has even been speculated to be the elusive Zodiac Killer, but no charges have ever been brought against him for any of the murders. While Diane Taylor seems to be the last unsolved child murder during the time, there is one final twist in the story of the Chicago child murders that would link another infamous unsolved triple disappearance in next door Indiana. The story begins with the disappearance of heir to the Brock candy business, Helen Voorhees Brock, in 1977. The multi-millionaire was last seen in a store near the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She was due to board a plane to return to her mansion just outside of Chicago, but was not actually seen on the flight. The subsequent investigation would uncover the possible link to a show horse racket based near Chicago. The FBI uncovered that up to 100 show horses were being killed after insurance was placed on the expensive animals in what has been called one of the most gruesome stories in sports history. It would not be until 1994 that 36 people were tried for a number of crimes, including fraud, extortion, and animal cruelty. Two of those men, stable owners Richard Bailey and Silas Jane, had sold horses to Helen Brock and it was believed she had discovered what was going on. Bailey was convicted for soliciting her murder, and though never proven, her limo driver, Jack Matlick, was believed to be the trigger man. That brings us to Silas Jane. Now sit back, because there's a lot here to unpack. Being first convicted of sexual assault at age of 17, Silas went on to become notorious in Chicago's show horse industry. He had beaten several rival jockeys so badly they could no longer compete. He demanded 10% of the profits from all horse shows in the area under the threat of more violence. 
He would also sell poor quality horses to rich families, telling them that they were champion breeds. Those families' daughters would frequently spend time at the stables unsupervised, and Silas boasted he had molested hundreds of them. When the families complained about their poor horses, he threatened to tell of their daughters' promiscuity if they pressed the matter. It was July 2, 1966, when 21-year-old Ann Miller and 19-year-olds Patricia Blow and Renee Brule came to the Indiana State Dunes for a day at the Pact Beach. Over 9,000 people were in attendance that day when the three girls were last seen in the afternoon speaking to a man before getting onto his three-hulled boat that resembled something like this one. Several hours later, when they noticed the girls' things, including their purses and car keys, were still there on the beach, so they turned them into the ranger station. Inside the purse was a note by Renee to her husband stating she wanted to leave him. It was two weeks old, and her family believed she had not actually intended to give it to him. Four days later, and about three miles away from the beach, the Coast Guard found the wreckage of a boat. However, no reports of a wreck boat had been made by any boat owners, and no one else was reported missing if all its occupants went down with it. One theory put forward was that Anne and possibly Patricia were pregnant by married men and got on the boat for an operation to terminate those pregnancies, which was illegal in Illinois at the time. After one of them died during the operation, the other two were killed to avoid witnesses. What gives this theory credence is that one of the men at the beach that day, Ralph Largo Jr., matched the description of the man seen talking to the girls. Ralph's aunt and uncle, Helen and Frank Largo, were known to be doctors who performed the operations. Another theory is that the girls planned to run away. Anne had supposedly told friends she was going to leave and enter a home for unwed mothers when her child was born. Likewise, Patricia is said to claim she too was going to leave where no one could find her. And let's not forget Renee's letter to her husband. Did the friends decide to leave together? Maybe. But then there's the fact that all three were known to have used the tricolor stables, owned by George Jane, half-brother to Silas Jane. Patricia is said to have been seen with bruises on her face a month before, which she claimed was a result of trouble with the well-known horse syndicate. Silas Jane had an employee who owned a boat the same colors as the one they were seen boarding, which he frequently took to Indiana Dunes, and upon questioning, said it was destroyed in a fire. In 1967, Illinois Deputy Ralph Probst was shot in his home after claiming to have stumbled upon something big involving the horse rackets. Silas is also said to have confessed to a sheriff about three bodies being buried on his property, but the sheriff died in a supposed farming accident before he could launch an investigation. The final theory is that Patricia had found out something relating to the car bombing incident a year before her disappearance that took the life of 22-year-old Cheryl Rude. Rude was an employee for George Jane. Silas was known to have a grudge against George after a business disagreement and George suspected him of burning his home and stables down. A few days after the car bombing, Silas would be caught in a sting operation attempting to hire someone to kill George, but the key witness claimed to have amnesia on the stand and Silas walked away with just one month's jail time. George would hire security, who placed a transmitter on Silas's car to alert him if it came within five miles of George's house. The man who had to replace the batteries on the transmitter would get in a gunfight with Silas at his house, which would be ruled as self-defense. George was shot and killed in his house in 1970. The assassin was identified and the money he had been paid was dusted for fingerprints. On them were those of Silas Jane. He would be convicted but paroled after just six years. During the Brock investigation, the FBI uncovered that one of Silas's former employees, Kenneth Hansen, had bragged of the murders of the Pearson and Schusler boys. Hansen would not be arrested for the crimes until 1995. A jury once again finds Kenneth Hansen guilty of killing three boys back in 1955. They deliberated for less than three hours before reaching the guilty verdict. WGN's Mary Hughes at the update desk. Mary, I'm sure relatives of uh, these young boys are relieved the trial's over. 
Definitely, Steve. Family members of two of the victims showed up at the courthouse just in time to hear the verdict today. They say they're glad it's over, that they could not go through yet another trial. We were with it all the time. I mean, we watched our, mo our mother suffer. Nancy Rauscher speaks about her stepmother. Eleanor Schusler died back in 1986, decades after her two sons were found murdered and years before anyone was put on trial. 69-year-old Kenneth Hansen stood with his cane as the guilty verdict was read. He stood next to his attorneys who've had his case two years. 24 people said the same thing twice. They said that he was guilty and he, he got what he deserved. The Predator would frequently troll the roads looking for young boys who he referred to as chicken. It was one such time that he had picked up three hitchhiking boys and lured them back to the idle hour stables under the pretext of seeing horses. Once there, Hansen sexually abused one or all of them and murdered them after they threatened to tell. When Jane discovered this, he did not want the bad press and instead decided to help cover it up. The pair dumped the bodies, and in May the following year, the barn that the murders occurred in coincidentally burned down in a suspected case of arson. It is believed Jane had police bribed, which may explain not only how he managed to get off so many times for his crimes, as well as the fact the stables were never investigated after neighbors reported hearing screaming coming from them the night of the murders. In 2000, Hansen's conviction was overturned, but he was retried in 2002 and convicted again. He died behind bars in 2007. Silas Jane died of leukemia in 1987. The Grimes sisters were known to have used Silas Jane's stables. After his death, a witness stated Ken Hansen was at the Brighton Theater the night the Grimes sisters went there. In 2005, DNA found on Barbara was analyzed, but the results were inconclusive. Police have since lost that sample to test against DNA from Kenneth Hansen. In 2007, police announced they do not believe Cook to be the killer of Judith Anderson. In 2018, Diane Taylor's case was also reopened, and her body was exhumed for testing. To date, those two cases, along with those of Patricia and Barbara Grimes, Gloria Kowalowicz, Ann Miller, Patricia Blow, and Renee Brule all remain unsolved.